We have with us on the line, as we show, let's show that videotape if we can again. It's, it's stunning videotape captured by our affiliate WFAA out of Dallas. Uh, specifically, the man with the camera hoisted on his shoulder was John Prague. John, are you with us? Uh, yes. John, um, I don't know how much experience you have with uh, space and shuttles, but did you have the sense as you watched this that something was amiss? Well, I'd seen the shuttle once before on reentry. I was in West Texas, and I, I heard it, uh, sonic boom, and I saw it pass over with the one contrail. So, yes, when I saw all these contrails uh, with reflective material um, in the early morning sky, I was, uh, it did um, seem unusual, but I, I have limited experience seeing the shuttle on reentry. So, yeah appear and even our anchor made mention of it we, we did a live shot at, at a little after eight o'clock when it came over dallas fort worth and we're talking about eight o'clock central time here just to clarify yep. for our viewers out there who are in various time zones uh, john uh what did you hear as you were shooting that do you recall i, I didn't hear anything you were pretty um, far it, away of course yes we uh we were um listening to nasa they were giving us updates on where the shuttle was um and um so we could get an idea when it would come over dallas fort worth we heard it, uh, that it was coming over Northern California, then Arizona, and then El Paso. And at that point, I started watching for it, of course. And uh, I, it, uh, suddenly it appeared. And uh, I, so I, I turned my camera on and started to uh, roll video. And we did, um, we shot it live as it came over uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. And, and at what point then did you have some realization that something went wrong? Uh, when I came back into the station, they were saying it was overdue. And and that's when we started to uh, re-roll the tape and uh, and then information started coming out of nasa uh, but it wasn't until i actually got back in the uh, newsroom that people were saying well it's overdue john proc videographer wfaa our affiliate in texas john proc we um, thank you for your efforts uh, in giving us this insight in the immediate aftermath of uh, the demise of the space shuttle columbia breaking up into several pieces there. Let's recap for, for those who are just joining us. As John uh, mentioned, the Space Shuttle Columbia was at the tail end of a 16-day science mission, seven-person crew. They were headed back home, and um, somewhere over central Texas, 100 miles south of Dallas or thereabouts, uh, this is what happened here. If you take a look here, you'll see start, what starts out normally uh, quickly becomes multiple trails there, multiple trails. That's something uh, that is very telling and no mistaking that that is an in-flight breakup. The question as to why is another matter entirely, which uh, we, we couldn't uh, get into without getting very deep into the world of speculation. But that shot tells you what happened. Uh, why it happened will be the subject of discussion for um, months and perhaps years to come. But here we go. Let's take a look at the shot. Now, I want, I want to call your attention. Watch that fireball. That's normal. One streak, very hot, coming from orbit, 2,000 plus degrees, dissipating heat, boom. Look at, the, look at that piece come off. And then, shortly thereafter, flash. See that flash right in there? And then a piece of smoke came off, a, a puff of smoke. Something happened there. So the, something happened first, then second. And then, uh, as it went along, further breakup, sort of a three-step process. One, a small piece, a flash, uh, and then very shortly thereafter, multiple pieces of the Space Shuttle Columbia. At that point, traveling 12,500 miles an hour, uh, just to give you a sense of it, they travel uh, around the, the planet at about 17,500 miles an hour. So having lost 5,000 miles an hour of speed already, still traveling the speed of a bullet. Let's take a look at the crew and tell you who was on board uh, for this 16-day science mission. Um, the po the uh, commander, uh, Rick Husband. If we can get some pictures up of them, that would be appreciated. Do we have the pictures? There we go. There's the crew. If you put that in Telestrate, I'll tell people who's who. Um, commander is... Um, Rick Husband, and uh, I don't have it in the Telestrator, so I can just tell you. Oh, yeah, there's Rick, Hus Rick Husband, and uh, he is a colonel in the United States Air Force. And uh, he was born July 12, 1957, from Amarillo, Texas, truly the pride of Amarillo, Texas. Uh, on his second mission, uh, his first mission, he flew as a uh, shuttle pilot, STS-96, aboard Discovery, 
in May of 1999. They went to the International Space Station. Unusual, uh, quite frankly, for these days for um, pilots to uh, rise to the level of commander on their second flight, but uh, Rick Husband was an unusually uh, good guy and a sharp guy at that. Also on board, and this is Ilan Ramon, colonel in the Israeli Air Force. This was the first Israeli ever to fly in space, the son of a Holocaust survivor who uh, spoke to us, and we'll be, we're trying to get some of these interviews together that we shot with them beforehand. We're hopeful that we'll have them for you shortly so you can hear from them in their own words, but spoke to us at length about um, what this meant to his country and how uh, his country, having endured uh, the Holocaust, uh, could not have fathomed an Is Israeli uh, traveling in space, looking down upon the Middle East and the rest of the world. Also on this flight, Michael Anderson, Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force, Plattsburgh, New York, his home. Uh, he was flying on a second mission. He flew in January of 98 on uh, STS-89, Space Shuttle Endeavor, flew to Mir. Um, and um, although he is a uh, person who sort of sat in the back of the, the shuttle and did uh, mission specialist duties, uh, has a lot of experience um, with flight in KC-135s and certainly with T-38s. Also on the, this particular mission, Laurel Clark, medical doctor, as you can see plainly there. Uh, Laurel um, hails from Racine, Wisconsin, came to uh, NASA in 1996, her first mission. Along with them, the pilot, person sits in the right-hand seat, right beside Rick Husband, William Willie McCool, Navy commander, born September of 1961, came from San Diego, uh, reported to NASA in 96. This was his uh, first flight. Uh, a man who uh, was familiar with uh, carrier landings, worked uh, out of Whidbey Island, and uh, flying the EA-6B Prowler, which you might be familiar with, also on the Space Shuttle Columbia. David Brown, captain of the United States Navy out of uh, Arlington, Virginia, pilot himself, although he wasn't uh, sitting in the front seats of the controls of the shuttle, he's a mission specialist, 2,700 hours in high-performance military aircraft, his first flight as well. Kaplana Chawla, born in uh, Kamaral, India. Uh, is uh, an astronaut with uh, some experience uh, in 1996, STS 87, U.S. microgravity payload, scientific mission. She operated the robotic arm on that particular mission. PhD, and um, for fun, she used to fly um, aerobatic uh, airplanes, tailwheel aerobatic airplanes. That was her passion in addition to space flight. There's the, the crew, and I was commenting about the suits that they're wearing there, those orange suits, those so-called pumpkin suits, launch and reentry suits, they call them. Uh, those suits were not worn um, in the years immediately after the first few missions up to Challenger. Uh, the crew went up in, in essentially a, a flight suit, just a jumpsuit, not a pressure suit. They wore helmets, but they didn't have the, the pressure suit. One of the reforms that came out of the Challenger accident was that these suits would be worn by the crew members um, as they rose to space and as they came back home. The idea being that if there was some sort of rapid decompression, loss of cabin atmosphere inside the flight deck and the mid deck, that the crew could survive. Um, but as we pointed out not too long ago, um, as, as we pointed out not too long ago, this is not a situation where the crew would even have the option of bailing out. That altitude, that speed, not a goal. Let's listen to James Hartsfield one more time. Houston. Space shuttle contingency procedures designed to secure all information, notes, and data pertinent to today's descent by the Space Shuttle Columbia. Communications were lost with the Space Shuttle Columbia at approximately 8 a.m. Central Time 
as Columbia was above north central Texas at an altitude of 200,000 feet, traveling approximately 12,500 miles per hour. Search and rescue forces in the Dallas Fort Worth area and in other portions along Columbia's planned route have been alerted to the space shuttle program contingency. Any debris that may be. All right, we're going to bring James Hartsfield down because it's a bit repetitive. If you've been watching, you know what he's going to say, which is don't touch any debris that you might see if you happen to be in that part of the world. Stay away from it. It could hurt you, could potentially kill you, and it's against the law to touch it. So don't do it. 